morning. On the 1st of October 1949, Mao Zedong, chairman of the Chinese Communist Party, claimed victory after two decades of civil war. Mao led China until his death in 1976. Mao seems to have genuinely sought to improve the conditions of the people of China, yet political, economic and social transformation came at a considerable cost to human life. Mao's power and control over China was so great that by 1976, Chinese communism had become known as Maoism. The extent to which Mao liberated or oppressed China has been a matter of ongoing historical discussion. With me to discuss Mao's methods of maintaining power in China, its strengths and its limitations, are Maxime Marjoie, Professor Emer Emeritus of Edinburgh House, Stella Roller Bigas, Visiting Professor at Queen's House, and Finavatu, Professor of History at Housen's House. Maxime Marjoie, what were the aims of Maoist propaganda? So the main aim of, of aims of the Mao propaganda and the CCP uh, propaganda was the mass indoctrination, which is a thought reform so that the population would support the mass, uh, mass campaigns. And um, in the years, there was a kind of an evolution of the aim. Of the aim. So in the early years of Mao, um, it was uh, to start and to gain um, support. He um, used propaganda as a, um, to gain particip participation in mass campaigns. For example, the Hundred Flowers campaign and um, the first uh, five-year plan and that kind of stuff. And then you got uh, the five year, uh, the first five year plan and the Great Leap Forward um, was used to inspire workers and citizens to support the economic goals. And then in the late 60s, we got uh, a, a whole different uh, view of propaganda, which was uh, more respecting and obeying uh, teachers, parents, and um, elderly people. I like, Professor, your reference to the transformation in people's thinking, the support of mass campaigns, and of course you mentioned the Great Leap Forward, the Cultural Revolution of 1966 onwards being another good example. And Mao, of course, thought that propaganda could make people revolutionaries and educate people about their role in society. The propaganda system, as you explain, is very central to communist rule. So how was it controlled and organised by the state? So it was... Um, central in one big organization which was the Central Propaganda Department and this was basically a network of local branches for the mass indoctrination um, so there will be part of there will be committees in the local um, provinces of the of whole China and also like next to the committees and um, we could have the PLA with five million soldiers who would in indoctrinate uh, the people and also prepare them for warf uh, warfare. And then um, also the barefoot doctors, uh, which had a political training before they actually went into the rural areas um, to help the people. Um, they had political training, so they would inspire them also politically in the way Mao wanted. And then also examples like Li Feng, uh, which was a perfect soldier and also a perfect communist citizen, which would be like an example for everybody in China, like this is how you should be. I like your references and your reference to the change in the 60s. And of course, Lin Biao, head of the PLA, is responsible for making Mao godlike, the saviour of China, at that stage of his control over China. Bradbury argues indeed that the CP CCP set about thought reform more purposefully, more massively and more intensively than of other ruling groups. What methods then do the CCP use to disseminate propaganda? Um, there are different views of methods. So you, if you look at the media first, you had visual, oral and literature. Um, this is quite special because there were so many different forms of uh, methods for the uh, propaganda. So visual started already in um, the early 50s with already banning movies and um, which were made before the revolution and then during 
go on in the 50s uh, was established a film a bureau for um, that the CCP could establish movies and films like they did in in the West and also in the uh, Soviet Union and then in the late si- like around um, 1964 um, more films were banned which had relation with uh, pre-revolution times. I, I like your reference to the film. Perhaps more striking even is the nationwide system of loudspeakers. How did they indoctrinate the people? So um, speakers would be controlled by the Central People's Broadcasting, which is um, a big radio and speakers in public areas, uh, for example, schools, um, um, yeah, schools, swimming pools, everything. There will be speakers, everything. But like basically telling people what's going on in the country and how perfect the CCP and Mao is actually doing. Yeah, it was well, always, it will always be positive. And with that all-pervasive nature of the Maoist ideology, we also get the People's Daily and the expectation that people read this political newspaper. And also, of course, the Little Red Book. So what was the Little Red Book? The Re- Little Red Book was basically a small book and it was in in the in the book with the included with um old speeches of Mao um songs everything like even poetry and that kind of stuff established in 1964 uh, if i remember correctly and um it was basically about Mao's cult he was an all-knowing revolutionary leader who was a living god he was a hero and defender of the chinese republic uh, Chinese, uh, yeah, Chinese Communist Republic, and it was a literature. It was a form of literature, but it was you were expected or and supposed to know everything in it, and you would be tested on it by soldiers around. And it was like you had you had to book everywhere where you were. You had the book in your pocket to take it out when everybody would ask it. I like the way you describe it being in your pocket. It would also go in a satchel. And the idea that it's all pervasive, that it's, it's very easy to, to draw upon that speeches and writings and to be able to prove Maoist ideology. And of course, 70, 750 million sold in the first four years. This suggests um, a great strength in propaganda. Was it successful in helping Mao to maintain power? And that's propaganda as a whole, as much as the Little Red Book. If I think propaganda in in completely was effective in the kind of way that um, like for example not only the literature and oral or visual propaganda would be would be effective but also campaigns and um, people believed in him also after when he died after his death uh, people will still use his um, ideology um, even he was gone and not physically dead to ensure people would use it and um, I think, yeah, I think it was very effective. However, um, if you look at campaigns who didn't work out, especially the Great Leap Forward, which has a massive um, um, a starvation of the people, which was like 40 million people dying. And um, it's basically, there was a fear of not being honest. So problems, um, would be suppressed and blamed on other people, especially people in the within the party, um, who were too enthusiastic about it. And I don't know, it's it's weird and every and I think significant about the propaganda. It was always for a short period of time. So, for example, the barefoot doctor speech was a really good thing in establishing of healthcare. Was only used a, 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 like twenty years, maybe ten. And then afterwards, and during the Great Leap Forward, when they were actually needed, they didn't show up. They didn't do anything about the famine. And I think that's really significant and actually showing that it wasn't effective, yeah, for the people. But it was for for his, it was for his um, Im- image, yeah, image. I think that's a, an interesting point you make and the fact that it's so crucial for the mass campaign. It's so crucial for getting the message across and thought reform. And yet equally can be detrimental to the people and could you say in terms of the economy the fact that for example some of the intellectuals within industry were made to work on the factory floor perhaps limited the extent to which they could transform industry i think the transformation of industry was always kind of controlled by um 
the CCP department. So they didn't have their own responsibility or stuff. So I think there was always a limit on the development, but I think that was what the CCP wanted. If I'm not, if I'm answering your question. In a way. Thank you. You are, you are, Professor. Thank you very much for your insights into propaganda. So we're going to turn now to <coughs> Professor Ola Bigas, who is, as I said earlier, visiting professor from Queen's House, to consider the main methods by which Mao maintained power through repression. Now, it's well known that Maoist repression was not as centralised as other single-party state dictatorships. This is not like the SS Gestapo complex in Hitler's Germany, but instead Mao expects the people to control each other, mainly through public humiliation, so it's a form of self-policing. Were there any centralised aspects or government control over repression? Well, um, as you said, it wasn't really a centralised um, method, but they had like the Central Investigation Department in the CCP since the creation of the People's Republic of China. And also the PLA, which is the People's Liberation Army, which was really important, which had a really important role in strength in strengthening um, Mao's party. And it was and by 1950, it was an enormous military force because it sort of like summarized uh, the like the virtues that that cultivated Mao in terms of like what he wanted in Mao's China. So discipline, self-sacrifice, endurance, and perseverance. But it wasn't really effective on terms of the people. Like, it didn't really terrorize them. Um, in fact, like, as you said, Mao believed more in, like, that people sh should be able to police themselves. So that's why, like, self-criticism was encouraging the struggle meet sessions and meetings, yeah. And can you explain what it meant to self-criticize? Yeah, so self-criticize was basically, like, self-humiliation. Like, for example, someone who had committed a crime would have to to like public humiliate themselves like in front of everyone <laughs> in and with that with that humiliation what else might they what, what else might happen to them to try to improve their thought well they would be sent to like rectification which were like the labor camps also known as lao gai in chinese which means reform through labor and well, basically, in those labor camps, where like now, right nowadays, they're no just as simple prisons, but like they were like prisons just for minor crimes. So, so in terms of this method, why did Mao use the method of self-policing in China? Was there anything particular about the educational system that might have lent itself to this form of repression? Um. Probably the mm, well, the he believed in like a continuous rev revolution, so which means like you, you know that they're continuously changing. For example, at the beginning of like the whole thing, they had like the Bourgeois C that was in favor of like the whole thing, but the CCP turned against them because they, they just saw them as counter-revolutionaries. and But they had always been like loyal to the party and served them, but now they became their victims. I think that's an interesting point. And you might also say, well, actually, in a society where at the time we have a rote learning rather than critical thinking, some historians would suggest that that also lent itself to this form of self-policing. What about the, the labour camps? You mentioned these labour camps. They were in incredibly challenging and harsh conditions. Why did they help to maintain power? Well, so in those labor camps, people were like they were forced to work in the countryside and like in like really, really hard conditions. Like some of them who were like forced to be there, they had they even committed suicide before going there. So yeah. So d a disincentive to, to challenge Mao. And indeed, the fact that families would be ostracised, those of prisoners or ex-prisoners, 
also was a, a disincentive to, yeah. to challenge the Mao's regime. So we've got two forms of maintaining power. We've got propaganda and we have repression. So having considered these forms of maintaining power, we're going to turn lastly to Professor Avatu, who has spent his recent career studying Maoist authoritarianism and the extent to which he achieved total control over China. First, Professor, would you be able to define <coughs> totalitarianism for the audience? Yeah, sure. Um, so totalitarianism is a sort of political concept uh, where the state recognizes no limits to their control and like its authority and they strive to regulate every area of um, the citizen's life. So they try to control the economics, the politics, but also the social life. And also in Mao's China, it was, it was far more than that. Mao tried to sort of create the ideal um, sort of human being that which distinguished it from sort of the um, monarchies and oligarchies <coughs> that we'd seen previously. So so it's the reshaping aspect that's particularly significant here and the idea of re-education being so crucial to Maoist ideology. Now, according to Lynch, few analysts would dispute that Mao wielded enormous power. To what extent do you think he did achieve totalitarianism? Um, I'd actually agree with that. He achieved it to um, quite a far extent, I would say. Um, but it, again, it fluctuated also his control over the nation. But generally, I would say um, he remained like in total control the entire time. For example, in the first few years of his power, uh, he was in full control and he only had a few advisors who advised him. And he basically all decisions that he made uh, were final. And the people also still loved him things like the three anti-campaign and the first five-year plan and as well as the uh, success in the Korean War allowed him like to gain major popularity with the people and it was this was important because it like it allowed him to sort of establish himself as the sole leader of China. So politically he had ultimate authority in in the Politburo um, and yet uh, there are times at which he withdraws from the political stage. For example, during the famine after the Great Leap Forward and during aspects of the Cultural Revolution. Surely this would suggest that there are limitations to Mao's authoritarian control or his totalitarian control, I should say, in China. Yeah, I would agree. Um, after the Great Leap Forward, uh, that caused about 14 to 20 million people to die of uh, starvation. Uh, his uh, authority and like sort of um, his legitimacy was like diminished after that um, and he decided to take a back seat in the in the party but uh, it's also fair to say that he did take a back seat however he returned and during that time where he was in the back seat of um, like political affairs in China he was still in total control and although he was like sort of a figurehead of the CCP he also, like the fact that he could come back from something so like terrible, like 45 million people dying, like it just says something about like how powerful as a person he was and how people sort of overlooked as, um, I think it was Fenby who said that, And Fenby said that the ultimate proof of his dominance was how many things he got wrong on a massive scale observable to all and how he still survived as a great leader untouched by the tough figures around him. Given Fenby's argument, uh, it is short right to excuse some of Mao's excesses then. So excesses then. So you, you made the example of the famine. You know, did they enable him to produce remarkable achievements and therefore can we excuse them historically? Um, I would say it's quite inexcusable sort of the uh, crimes he committed against the people and while they did like achieve the results and brought like um, China to the industrial place possibly that they are today. Good. I think certainly D would agree with you. I, I know that, that he argues that the movements for which Mao is almost universally condemned today, the Great Leap Forward and especially the Cultural Revolution were in many ways beneficial for the Chinese people 
they forced China to break with its Stalinist past and pave the way for great economic and political strides. Whereas, as you interpret, you know, is this can this ever be excusable? So, what was the impact of Mao's totalitarianism on the people? I would say, um, sort of, the overwhelming majority of them uh, suffered quite heavily from it. Um, but it's also quite hard to say because um, of the propaganda at the time. And in fact, there was also a lot of improvements, like socially. I know the public health system, um, I think the life expectancy was doubled during his time in power and things like that. However, I think the people's um, sort of like welfare definitely took a back seat to um, Mao's e- e- economic policies as well as his sort of idea of what China needs to be as a whole. And the people were just sort of individual like in, just made up the numbers yeah i think it's a, an interesting interpretation and so we have some conflicting views here and i'd like to bring all of you back to the table now to discuss overall then what our interpretation of mao is and we have different conflicting views is he a visionary is he a genius should he be remembered foremost as a tyrant so if we start with the visionary and mao's successes what would you bring to the table in terms of his greatest achievements in China? Greatest achievements? I think gaining power in ways that are actually horrible. But I think that's, that's maybe not an achievement, but the gaining power and that he was still popular also after his death, when people could come and rise and say, like, this has he done, it's not normal. Why they have we let this happen for such a long time, which happened with Hitler and other um, totalitarian uh, leader, leaders. And I think that's significant. So in terms of, um, would you say the rise to power, actually the fact that he has political, he brings political cohesion, control after a long period of difficulty, after 20 years of civil war, was this enough to call him visionary? Or does it require more? Mm, I don't really think he was that visionary. I just think he made like a good use of propaganda, for example. Because like, out of China, people thought that like Chinese government and China was doing like really, really good, and they were improving, and like things were great there. But indeed, they weren't. But like they just advertised it as it was. And for example, in the leap in the Great Leap Forward, they had like. Well, the government like sort of changed the numbers of like the labor and like the things they did, so that people thought that other like cooperatives were doing like really really good, so they would encourage people doing more. So that was like a way of manipulating information. I, I like your interpretation that the idea of Mao Mao as visionary and genius is is a partly a construct and it's it's based on the propaganda, but. Could we attribute, can we say there's such a significant transformation of China during his ascendancy that actually we have to credit him with real success here? There were loads Mm. of successes. And can you give me examples of what was successful? I think social economic of the first five-year plan was successful, how it boosted the whole of China. But then what is kind of sad about Mao, Mao's look on the things that he does it again and tries to do it with a great leap forward and then it fails but he doesn't admit that it fails he just pressed the whole uh, disaster and then it kind of can't, can't be improved so it's not really development it's more like going up down up down up down so and some ups will have some impact on the future things but I think it takes the country so much, it took the country so much down with everything, every disaster afterwards so I think, yeah I don't know. In terms of, so whether it was the the huge human cost or otherwise Mao's tyranny, does that undermine uh, as Professor Avatu suggested, does this undermine his legacy? Should we be interpreting him mainly as a tyrant? Yes. I think so, because, I mean, 45 million people, like, just to put it into perspective, about 6 million people died 
in the Holocaust and 45 million people is only the people counting in the famine there's probably countless more sort of the concentration camps and things like that um, so like 45 million I mean you know, like, people. that's like how many people live in the ne- Netherlands I thought so I people think that live in Spain yeah that would be like the entire population of the country so ultimately uh, are you in agreement that if you had the uh, are you know, is Mao a liberator is he oppressor can he be both Maybe, but I think he's more, he had a more negative impact at the end than positive. Maybe not at the time realized, but afterwards, I think so. I think he had like a good impact in terms of like the country, but like if you then look to like each individual separately, it wasn't. Because like in terms of like society and things like that, but then like there were like really great improvements in industry, for example that it became like worldwide known China like as a really important indus- industrial co- country. So. So, so listening to all your views, p- perhaps the consensus then is that even though there was a genuine desire to improve the conditions of the people and there was undoubtedly political, economic and social transformation, it came at such a cost to human lives that you feel that undermines ultimately what he achieved and should arguably be the foremost legacy for you, for Mal. Well, many thanks indeed, professors, for your excellent contributions today. And thank you to our viewers for listening to Mao's China. How did Mao maintain power?